Hello and welcome to another episode of Mastering Quantum Mechanics Through Problems. My name is Dr. Jacob Hudis. The title of today's lesson is the stern gerlach Experiment and Mathematics of the Polymatrix Vector. Today I'm going to delve into the stern gerlach Experiment, a cornerstone in the study of quantum mechanics, and walk you through some of the essential mathematics needed to quantify its results. By observing how particles are deflected through a magnetic field, we can see firsthand how quantum systems behave, providing us with a tangible grasp of quantum superposition and the probabilistic nature of quantum measurement. Terrific. Let's start by talking about the magnetic moment of a current loop and an electron. This is a picture of current flowing in a loop. It produces a magnetic field and it has a magnetic moment. A magnetic moment is a vector quantity that points from the south pole to the north pole of a magnet and is intrinsically linked to the magnetic field generated by the moving electric charges. In the case of a current loop, the magnetic moment is oriented perpendicular to the plane of the loop, with its direction determined by the current flow. The vector not only indicates the orientation, but also relates directly to the strength of the magnetic field produced by the current. It turns out elementary particles like electrons and protons also produce magnetic fields, and therefore have a magnetic moment. For this reason, we can think of an electron or proton as a tiny ball of spinning charge, even though that's not really the case. A classical model, where the electron is treated as a spinning sphere, would imply that points on the surface move faster than the speed of light, violating the principle of relativity. Criminy! Additionally, this model predicts an incorrect gyromagnetic ratio, which differs significantly from the experimentally observed value of 2. No, no, no. These discrepancies highlight the incompatibility of the classical spinning model with quantum theory. Quantum theory says the electron is a point-like entity with intrinsic spin. When a magnetic dipole, which is a current loop, or an electron, enters a non-uniform magnetic field, it experiences an upward force if the magnetic moment is aligned with the field, and a downward force if the magnetic moment is anti-aligned with the field. This just comes from classical electricity and magnetism. The potential energy of a magnetic moment in a field is negative mu dot b, where mu is the dipole moment and b is the magnetic field. Objects always want to move to the lowest possible potential energy. This tells us that if a current loop is in a field like this, it will be forced upward if the magnetic moment is parallel to the field, and if this were flipped upside down, it would be forced downward when the magnetic moment is anti-parallel to the field. This is the stern gerlach experiment that I'll be discussing on the next several slides, as well as solving the mathematics to quantify the probability. This is Stern and this is Gerlach. He looks like he was having a bad hair day. In the stern gerlach experiment, a beam of silver atoms is heated and directed through a collimator. The beam then passes through an inhomogeneous magnetic field. Between the south and north poles of this magnet is an inhomogeneous magnetic field. The beam splits into two different paths, corresponding to spin-up and spin-down states of the atoms. The deflected atoms are then detected on a screen, revealing two distinct spots which demonstrate the quantization of angular momentum in quantum mechanics. Silver atoms were used in the stern gerlach experiment because they have a single unpaired electron in their outermost electron shell. Silver has 47 electrons, but 46 of them are paired up, leaving only one unpaired electron in the outermost shell. It's the 5s1 configuration. The unpaired electron carries a magnetic moment that is not canceled by the other electrons. Now let's discuss the stern gerlach experiment in more detail. Imagine the particle is initially prepared with its magnetic moment pointing upward. In this state, it's sent with some velocity through the magnetic field. It will experience an upward force to the interaction between its magnetic moment and the magnetic field gradient. Classically, this would predict the particle being deflected upward and being detected at the top of the screen. In this scenario, there is no discrepancy between the classical and quantum predictions. The particle is observed at the top of the screen, and classical theory agrees with the experiment. Now imagine that the particle's magnetic moment is tilted upward, but it's not all the way upward. It's at an angle like this. If the spin is tilted upward and not fully aligned with the magnetic field, classical theory predicts that the particle would experience both a torque and a force. The average force would be smaller and the deflection would be less. Classical theory predicts that the particle would be deflected less and it would be detected at this location, which is below the top of the screen. However, the results of the experiment show a different outcome. When a stream of particles, all in the same tilted spin state, is sent into the magnetic field, they are not detected at a spot below the top of the screen. Instead, some particles are detected at the very top of the screen, and some particles are detected at the very bottom of Amazing. the screen with a specific probability distribution. This suggests that the particles enter the magnetic field in a superposition of spin-up and spin-down states, with the measurement at the screen collapsing the wave function and determining its final position. 
for a spin prepared in this state, do you think the probability would be higher to be measured here or here? There'd be a higher probability to measure it here, and we're going to work out that calculation shortly. The picture on this slide is a scenario that mirrors the previous one, but with a magnetic moment tilted downward instead of upward. Classically, you would expect the particle to be detected just above the bottom of the screen due to the combined torque and force acting on it. However, the experimental results tell us a different story. Quantum mechanically, the particle is detected with a certain probability at the top of the screen and with another probability at the very bottom of the screen. The outcome reflects the fact that the particle is in a linear superposition of both spin-up and spin-down states when it enters the magnetic field. In this case, there is a higher probability of the spin being measured at the bottom of the screen. I will soon work out the exact probabilities to give you a clearer picture of the quantum behavior. If the spin was tilted all the way down, what would happen? In that case, both quantum and classical results would agree. Now let's go through and solve the problem using all the necessary mathematics and not leaving out any steps. So much algebra. So here's the question. A spin one-half particle has a magnetic moment initially prepared in a state described by the spherical coordinates theta and phi. What is the probability that the particle will be found in the plus C state corresponding to location A at the top of the screen? And what is the probability that it will be found in the minus C state corresponding to location B. To solve this, express the spin state in terms of the plus and minus Z basis. There's a spin one-half particle and it has a magnetic moment and the magnetic moment can point in any direction and that direction is defined by an angle theta relative to the Z axis and phi relative to the X axis. If it's prepared in a given state, and then we send that particle into an inhomogeneous magnetic field. What is the probability that it's detected at the top of the screen? And what is the probability that it's detected at the bottom of the screen? AcePhysics.org, math and physics tutoring with Dr. Hudis. Step one to solve the problem. In the context of the stern gerlach experiment, a spin one-half particle is prepared in a specific spin direction. To solve the problem, we need to write a unit vector in the direction of the magnetic moment of the electron. Below is the general formula for the unit vector and spherical coordinates applicable for any theta and phi. Additionally, two specific examples are provided to illustrate the magnetic moment direction for particular values of theta and phi. This n hat is a unit vector that points in any direction. This is an equation that you may have seen in some of your math classes. You've certainly seen this if you've taken vector calculus or multivariable calculus. The magnetic moment is equal to mu naught, the magnitude of the magnetic moment, times the unit vector. Here's a specific example. If theta is equal to 45 and phi is equal to zero, that means that there's an angle of 45 degrees with the z-axis and the magnetic moment would point in this direction. The magnetic moment is in the xz plane in this case. If theta is equal to 60 degrees and phi is equal to 30 degrees, then you make an angle of 60 degrees with the z-axis and 30 degrees with the x-axis, and the magnetic moment would point off in this direction, and the magnitude, the length of this vector, would equal to the magnitude of the magnetic moment of the particle. Step two, write the Hamiltonian. Let's recall a key concept from freshman physics. The energy of a current loop in a magnetic field is given by the dot product of the magnetic moment mu and the magnetic field B h is equal to negative mu dot b. This is a fundamental equation you might remember from earlier studies. It's not new to quantum mechanics, but it's foundational for what we're about to do. Here we introduce the poly matrices, sigma x, sigma y, and sigma z, which are essential in quantum mechanics. These matrices contain critical information that we'll use to solve our problem. The key step is to replace the unit vectors in our expression with these poly matrices. We just said that the magnetic moment mu is equal to mu naught times the unit vector. What we do is we replace EX with sigma X, EY with sigma Y, and EZ with sigma Z, and this is our mu operator. This step has no classical analog. It's unique to quantum mechanics. It reflects how we solve a two-state problem using poly matrices, which can be challenging due to its purely quantum nature. You can find more details in the Feynman Lectures, Chapter 33, Volume 1, and many other books. Unfortunately, a deeper explanation of why it works this way is elusive. If you have additional insights, please share them in the comments below. To get the spin one-half Hamiltonian, you take the mu matrix, you multiply it by bz, we'll replace sigma x, sigma y, and sigma z with their respective matrices, and that gives you this Hamiltonian matrix, and that simplifies to this Hamiltonian matrix. This is a spin one-half Hamiltonian for a particle with its magnetic moment oriented at any direction. This Hamiltonian describes a spin one-half particle in a magnetic field where the magnetic moment is oriented at an arbitrary angle relative to the z-axis. 
This problem is fundamental in quantum mechanics and frequently encountered. While it may be challenging to grasp an intuitive origin of this Hamiltonian, it's crucial to understand its implications, how it functions, and what it reveals about the system. Given its importance, memorizing this Hamiltonian can be beneficial. I should just memorize this spin Hamiltonian? All right then, I'll go ahead and memorize it. Good idea. You should memorize this spin one-half Hamiltonian. All right then, I'll go ahead and memorize it. And for the final step of the problem, we need to solve for the eigenvectors of the Hamiltonian. If a Hamiltonian is multiplied by a constant, the eigenvectors of the matrix without the constant are the same. So we don't need to worry about the constant out in front. We'll take the constant out in front and slide it under the rug and not tell anybody about it. Now we have this matrix. We want to find the eigenvalues for this matrix and then use those to get the eigenvectors. In order to do that, we subtract lambda down the diagonal, take the determinant, set it equal to zero, and this gives the characteristic equation. I've done this on many of my previous videos in this playlist. This, this, minus this, this is equal to zero. Here we have the characteristic equation. This leads to this equation using the trigonometric identity cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta is equal to one we get lambda is equal to plus or minus one and these are the eigenvalues now we're going to take the eigenvalues and use them to get the eigenvectors now that we have the eigenvalues let's solve for the eigenvector so what i'm going to do is solve for the eigenvector corresponding to the eigenvalue lambda equals to plus one there's going to be a lot of algebra here but physics is married to algebra. Physics is also married to calculus and linear algebra and trigonometry. Physics has many partners. Does that mean physics has issues? Probably, physics has issues. For the case lambda equals to plus one, in order to solve for the eigenvectors, we take the Hamiltonian equation with lambdas down the diagonal and we replace the lambda with plus one. Now this is gonna lead to two equations. We really only need one of the equations. The top equation is cosine of theta minus one times z plus plus e to the minus i theta sine of theta times z minus is equal to zero. We also know that z plus squared plus z minus squared has to equal to one. This is the normalization condition of quantum mechanics. Now let's take, now I took this equation and moved it down here, and I'm going to solve this equation for z minus. So I'll subtract this term to this side and divide by e to the minus i phi sine of theta. And what we're left with is z minus is negative cosine of theta minus one by e to the minus i phi sine of theta. And this is one minus cosine of theta divided by e to the minus i phi sine of theta. And of course, there's a z plus there. But because of the normalization condition, I know that z plus squared plus z minus squared, which is this term, is equal to one. This term has a z plus squared in it. So I can factor out a z plus squared. I just multiply this by sine squared of theta over sine squared of theta to get a common denominator. And now we have z plus squared times sine squared of theta plus one minus cosine squared of theta divided by sine squared of theta is equal to one. Now, if I use the FOIL method of multiplication and multiply this out, I have sine squared of theta plus one minus two cosine of theta plus cosine squared of theta divided by sine squared of theta is equal to one. Cosine squared of theta plus sine squared of theta is equal to one. And therefore this becomes z plus squared times two times one minus cosine of theta divided by sine squared of theta is equal to one. There's a finite number of trigonometric identities, about six of them, that we use in physics all the time. They're a little tricky, but they come up all the time, so you should just get used to it. One of them is the half angle identity. We know that one minus cosine of theta is two sine squared of theta over two. Therefore, two times one minus cosine of theta is four sine squared of theta over two. And this can be replaced with the top term. And then the bottom term, sine squared of theta using the double angle identity is four sine squared of theta over two times cosine of squared of theta over two and the sines on top and bottom are gonna cancel. This then becomes z plus squared times one over cosine squared of theta over two is equal to one. And that tells us that z plus squared is equal to cosine squared of theta over two or z plus is equal to cosine of theta over two. Now we need to solve for z minus. This column was copied from the previous slide. So z minus, we already showed, is equal to one minus cosine of theta divided by e to the minus i phi sine of theta times z plus. Now I can use the same trigonometric identity, one minus cosine of theta is equal to two sine squared of theta over two, and replace the top with that. And then sine of theta is equal to two sine of theta over two, cosine of theta over two, and then we're left with z minus equals e to the plus i phi, because e to the minus i phi, when it goes to the top, becomes e to the plus i phi, times sine of theta over two, divided by cosine of theta over two, multiplied by z plus. We already solved for z plus, and z plus 
with z plus squared is equal to cosine squared of theta over 2. z plus is cosine of theta over 2. And therefore, z minus is equal to e to the minus i phi sine of theta over 2. As for the eigenvector corresponding to minus 1, it's solved in the same way. Enjoy the rewarding process of doing math. When the particle has a magnetic moment which is tilted upward, the eigenvector is cosine of theta over 2 times plus z plus e to the i phi sine of theta over 2 times minus z. If I square this, that's cosine squared of theta over 2, and that tells me the probability that the particle will land at location A at the top of the screen. And if I square this, it tells me that there's a sine squared theta over 2 that the particle will be detected at the bottom of the screen. When the particle has a magnetic moment which is tilted downward, these reverse. This is the eigenvector. I didn't solve for this eigenvector. I'll let you do that on your own. It's following all the same steps that we did. And what you get is that there's a sine squared theta over 2 probability that the particle lands at the top of the screen and a cosine squared theta over 2 probability that the particle is detected at the bottom of the screen. The phi has no impact on the probability for whether the particle is detected at the top or the bottom of the screen. Can you explain why in the comments section below? Thank you for joining me for this installment of Learning Quantum Mechanics Through Problems. I'm Dr. Jacob Hudis. Please check out my website, acephysics.org. Like, comment, and subscribe to my channel. acephysics.org. Math and Physics Tutoring with Dr. H. acephysics.org. Math and Physics Tutoring with Dr. Hudis.